Okay, so today what we're going to take a look at is the Newton's laws and look at them in a bit more detail than you get at AS level. And then we're going to move on to looking at impulses and force time graphs. So what we've got written here is the Newton's three laws, and these are the main things you need to know. Some of them you've seen before, some of them you'll have seen but not quite as much detail, and some of them might be just plain new. Anyway, let's get started. So Newton's first law, any object remains at rest or in uniform motion unless acted on by a force. Now the first part of it, uh, remaining at rest, I think is pretty intuitive. You're like, something's sitting there, nobody touches it, nobody's pushing it, it's going to stay there, it's not going to move around. So that part's kind of obvious. The second part is less intuitive. It says if an object's in like, um, like motion, so it's moving, I don't know, 5 meters per second, and it's not acting on a force, it's going to continue moving at 5 meters per second. And that doesn't quite make sense to us as humans, I guess, because when you ever see anything moving, eventually what you see is it will start to slow down until it comes to a stop. So I don't know if you uh, like push a trolley or a wheelie chair or something like that, you find it generally will come to a halt, but obviously, although you can't see someone acting on it, it's been acted on by a frictional force, so that frictional force has caused it to decelerate to zero. But if you, I don't know, push a wheelie chair in space, if somehow we got a wheelie chair in space, what you'd find is when you pushed it, there'd be no frictional force acting on it. So it would keep moving at the speed it left your hand at, effectively. So if, you, if it was traveling at five meters per second in space, it'd keep traveling at that forever until it reached the edge of the universe. And God knows what will happen to it then. But anyway, so that's Newton's first law, and that's pretty standard, so you just need to know about that. So the second part is Newton's second law. Now, many of you have seen this in a slightly different form before, because from AS and maybe maths, you'll have come across F equals M A bog standard equation that you probably use loads of times, and you're like, that's Newton's second law. Actually, that's not what Newton said, and that's not what we know Newton's second law as. So Newton's second law actually is the rate of change of momentum of an object is proportional to the resultant force acting on it. So first of all the question is what well, what is this mystery momentum we've suddenly started talking about? And the momentum we sometimes use the letter P for momentum is the object's mass times by the object's velocity. Okay. So what we're saying is that the force is proportional to so the rate so the rate of change of this momentum is proportional to the force. So what you'd find is obviously then so what we're saying is F is proportional to the rate of change of momentum, so that's your change in momentum over a change in time. And obviously, if mass stays the same, then what you'll find is that this ends up being a way to rewrite f equals ma, because obviously you can change dv over dt into a, so then you get your f equals ma. But what if mass isn't constant? What if, say, we're in a rocket that's burning fuel at a quite a fast rate, so its mass is actually decreasing as it travels through space? Then Newton's second law in the current the format we've seen it before, this F equals MA format, doesn't work anymore because we've got a changing mass, so we've got something else, like another variable in it, which is why we use this more specific version of Newton Newton's second law, where the rate of change of momentum is proportional to the resultant force, because that holds true even if the mass is changing, the acceleration is changing, the force is changing, whatever, that is always true. So that's an improvement on our AS formula, if you like, and that's the more detail that you need at this next A2 level. So the third uh, Lord Newton's law that you need to know about is that when two objects interact, they exert equal and opposite forces on each other. And this becomes important later on when we start to look at objects colliding. We think about maybe explosions, which we come on to in this topic. And it's this law that's really important, and that's what comes into play when two objects collide with each other. Okay. 
So another new concept that we need to introduce at the level this level is the idea of an impulse. Now what we define an impulse is, is it's a force times the amount of time that you apply that force, okay? So in the previous part what we said was is that force is we had was directly proportional to the change in momentum over change in time. So let's put that into the equation that we've got here, which means your impulse is actually going to be your change in momentum over your change in time. And then you're wondering why the change in time, which obviously you can cancel those out. So what you can see from that is, and let's get rid of those for so we're not getting confused, is that an impulse is effectively a change in momentum. So if you have an object and apply that an impulse to it, what you're actually doing is you're changing that object's momentum. And obviously that will have an effect of changing its velocity, and that will obviously depend on how much mass it has. But an impulse is effectively a way of changing the momentum of an object. So let's have a look at this graphically, because obviously it's never quite as simple as it seems. So let's put our two axes. We've got force, which we obviously measure, always include units on your axes. You've got your newtons, and you've got your time in seconds. So let's have a graph of force against time. So you can make this as confusing or as wiggly as you like. I probably shouldn't have gone back. On myself here that doesn't really make any sense because apparently the force has gone back in time which is ridiculous okay so we have a sketch of a graph and we're interested in well what's the change in the momentum of the object and you're like whoa that force has gone crazy it's all over the place doesn't matter because the impulse as we've seen above was your force times by your change in time so if we want to know how much the momentum of the objects change in this time all we need to do is work out the area under our curve and that will tell us our change in momentum which we're, we can obviously use to work out a whole bunch of other things. You might be like, well, that's a pretty complicated graph to be finding the area under and it's true, like if you tried to use some sort of crazy equation to work out what it was, that would take you days. Obviously, what we did at AS when we were doing area under graphs when we were looking at springs and things is obviously you do this on graph paper not on this plain rubbish like I'm using so what you'd find is obviously you've got these squares and obviously what you can do is you can say well got I'm just gonna go up to the, say I wanted to work out what the change in momentum was up until this point here I'll say that square, and I reckon those two together make another one, and those two there make another one. So what's that? So we've got 12 squares, and then depending on however many, what the units were on the axis, then you could work out what each square represented, and then you could work out the change in the momentum of your object, which is a very useful thing to be able to do, in terms of, and you'll see as we go on further through the topic, that that becomes a really useful thing to have in calculations. And you'll see, well, if we have an impulse acting on it, this what happens, and like all oh, the momentum changes. But we'll get to that in due course.